good evening. Welcome to tonight's edition of Resistance TV. Uh, this evening, we're going to try something a little bit uh, different to our normal programmes. We're hoping to do a series of programmes with an academic called Rod Driver, who I'll introduce in a moment. And he's going to be speaking about bloodsucker capitalism. And we want to do a series of, uh, of programmes with Rod talking about different issues. And Rod's going to speak for probably 15, 20 minutes or so, rather than getting into the con conversational format that we've previously used on Resistance TV. Uh, then there'll be a Q&A with myself, and then we'll open it up to the floor as we normally do. Uh, but uh, can we get Rod onto the screen now? And uh, Rod, obviously you're going to speak this evening about this uh, topic, this bloodsucker capitalism, which I, I quite like as an alternative to uh, neoliberalism, which is a term I've often used to describe the economic perspectives that we've been saddled with for the last 40 plus years since, uh, well, really since uh, Dennis Healy, ill-advisedly went to the uh, International Monetary Fund in 1976 uh, on the false pretext that we were running out of money, which is impossible in a country that issues its own currency. But we won't necessarily get into too much detail about that this evening. But could you just say, Rod, just to begin with, before you get into the meat of what you are going to speak about this evening, about the series of discussions that we're going to be doing with you over the uh, uh, coming weeks and months? Sure, Chris. Well, thanks for having me on the show. So, uh, a little while ago, I uh, set up a website called Elephants in the Room, which is intended to try to explain uh, to people uh, all the things that the mainstream media does not discuss honestly. And so that can be certain aspects of economics or what companies do. It can be about British and American war crimes and so on. And uh, over the coming uh, seven or eight weeks, uh, if things work out, then I will try to explain what I think are the most important sets of topics to help people understand what's really going on and all the things that everybody needs to know uh, if they're really to make sense of the world in that there is so much distortion. If you, watch, if you get all your news from the mainstream media, then you won't really understand the world at all. So it'll be interesting to see if I'm able to uh, to give people a head start on understanding how things uh, uh, really work. Great. Well, that's a, a real challenge. And I think it's a very important thing uh, that we do because, I mean, I've read some of your blogs, obviously, and, uh, you know, we are absolutely smothered with with propaganda. And it's not just recent propaganda. I mean, I've talked about the last 40 years, but we've been, and you make this point, I think, in some of your blogs, you know, about the kind of propaganda about the kind of capitalist system and, uh, you know, the role of, of industry, et cetera. We've been... We've been overwhelmed with this propaganda for well over a century now, haven't we? And, uh, you know, the way we venerate uh, the rich and powerful and the way they're spoken about in positive terms on the on the media and so on and so forth. It does have a kind of, a, you know, a trickle down, you might say, impact on, on people's uh, perceptions, really, about Absolutely. what's good and what's bad in that sense. So, uh, so yes, I think this will be hopefully will be a valuable start to trying to, you know, change, change the uh, change the whole, you know, uh, sort of sense of. Of, of how we think about these things. Well, let's, uh, let's give it a go. I was really glad you mentioned the word propaganda there because uh, whilst we will talk specifically about propaganda uh, later on in the series, it actually underpins many of the things that I talk about. And m most people, if you say the word propaganda to them, they think, oh, First World War, Second World War, something like that. But in fact, yeah. it permeates our societies. It's all around us. And the whole point about it is to make us unquestioning or uncritical of the existing economic, corporate, and financial, and, and also political systems, as well as the, the military stuff. And mm. connected to that, there's a second topic that permeates everything I talk about, and that is power. And the whole point about propaganda is to hide what people who have too much power get up to. So yes. hopefully we can shine a light on that as we go. No, so, indeed. Well, let's get into the meat of what you're going to speak about this evening then, Rod, and uh, yeah. then see so, what our audience has got to say about that. I use the term bloodsucker capitalism to explain how big companies rig the economy in order to extract wealth from the economy that they shouldn't really uh, receive. So there's a kind of myth that companies earn their wealth and that rich people earn their wealth. But in fact, there's lots of ways in which they take wealth out that they, they shouldn't really uh, get. So we're going to just summarize uh, the most important ones uh, of those. So what we're talking about what are sometimes called free lunches, how to make excess profits 
without really earning them. So the first point to understand is that there's no such thing as a free market. And the free market is one of the great propaganda terms. How could anyone possibly object to the idea of uh, a level playing field? But in fact, a level playing field only makes sense when there is no inequality to start with. But actually what we have are some very, very powerful businesses. So uh, free market actually means instead of one person, one vote, what you end up is one pound, one vote. The more money you have, the more power you have. And so what we see around the world and in Britain is that many industries are dominated by a small number of very powerful companies. So you've got a small number of banks, you've got a small number of supermarkets, and so on. And when you've got that situation, uh, much of the time, those companies are able to find ways to overcharge their customers to make excess uh, profits. And one of the interesting things is the most famous economist historically who is known for saying the magical hand of the market, a man called Adam Smith, he did actually write about this very specifically. He said the magical hand of the market only applies to small businesses. When you have big, powerful businesses, bad things happen if you don't regulate them very, very carefully. They get corrupted by power. So you realize that big companies have bigger advertising budgets. They employ armies of lawyers and tax specialists. So they set up international structures to avoid paying tax. They're able to pay bigger bribes. And in a later uh, presentation, we'll talk actually about corporate crimes, which is a huge issue that hardly anyone um, talks about. They do a lot more lobbying to manipulate politics behind the scenes. So they have immense power to manipulate the marketplace. So a very famous writer called Noam Chomsky uses the term really existing capitalism to describe what actually goes on. And uh, one aspect of that is what you might call crony capitalism. So that's a very powerful relationship between governments and big business. And in fact, the subsidies to big business uh, in Britain are approximately 90 billion pounds a year. That's an enormous chunk of the economy. And in America, it's close to a trillion dollars a year. It really is a phenomenal amount of money. And this is money that most of these companies that receive it, most of them are very big, very wealthy, they don't need. And much of this money ends up in the pockets of executives and shareholders. So it's a, a very clear cut example of a free lunch. So uh, for for anyone who's old enough to remember the financial crisis in 2008, the best example of a subsidy is probably the banking bailout, where enormous amounts of money in both Britain and America uh, end up stabilizing the banking system, but ultimately ended up uh, enriching the rich predominantly. But you see subsidies in airline industry where they don't pay tax on fuel. You get farm subsidies, mostly going to big farmers, and so on. It's completely widespread throughout the economy. And governments also uh, fund a great deal of research. And you can see this particularly, say, in the pharmaceutical industry, so medicines, where a government will do a lot of funding of the initial research. But ultimately, a patent will be granted to a private company that then limits access to the medicines that have been developed and overcharges for them. And so, again, they get a, a free lunch. Uh, so I think we have to seriously question, Mark, Ask, ask a question, why it is that executives and shareholders are receiving vast amounts of money when the, the subsidies coming from the government are so large? And then there's another aspect of free lunches, which is that companies don't pay the full cost of their activities. So you see this particularly, say, with pollution, uh, where companies all over the world pollute rivers, they pollute the air, they pollute the land but they don't pay for it. And in the worst uh, recent example, uh, WikiLeaks released evidence of a company called Trafigura dumping toxic waste off the coast of Africa. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. The ones that we know about are just the ones that have been explored in depth and sometimes companies are fined. It's never a sufficient punishment to stop them doing the activities they do. So things like global warming are a cost that companies are not paying for. And uh, very famously, some years ago, Michael Moore in America made a film called Roger and Me, where he talked about his hometown of Flint, Michigan, where the General Motors factory was closed down to be relocated in Mexico. 
And it wasn't just a few jobs that were lost at the General Motors factory. The whole town collapsed because there was a huge kind of ecosystem of supply companies and so on. So the costs to society of closing that factory were immense. And the company doesn't pay for those costs. So what we've got is a sort of uh, private profit, but social costs system. And again, you have to question why when society pays such a huge price, for the activities of companies, are we allowing them to extract such huge, um, huge profits? So if we look specifically at the aspects that I would call acting like bloodsuckers, the profit motive is meant in theory, if you look in an, an, econo in an economics textbook, to motivate companies to be innovative and to be efficient. Well, in the past, maybe that was true. But these days, mostly, it seems to motivate companies and executives to commit more criminal activity, to commit more frauds, and to exploit other people, say customers, staff, and suppliers, to engage in tax manipulation, uh, and so on. So if we, if we just uh, sort of look at a few of those, with the crimes, I'm going to look at that specifically in a later week. But if we just look at the exploitation of other groups of people, uh, if we start with employees, many people will have heard recently of cases of Uber and Deliveroo trying to pretend that their staff are self-employed. And this has enabled them to get away with paying below the minimum wage. Similarly, there have been examples in the media of clothing suppliers, so subcontractors to the big clothing companies, uh, uh, paying below the minimum wage as well. And if we look internationally, uh, it's very well documented that contractors in, say, Bangladesh, in the clothing industry, uh, uh, employ large numbers of people in appalling conditions. And this is just a sort of universal system of exploitation of employees. And we can see further examples in the UK of people at Amazon uh, not being allowed to go for toilet breaks and things like that. And in fact, this is spreading more widely. So even in the university sector, we see that universities are creating fake subsidiaries, which are then used to employ all the staff. And so the staff can em be employed on worse terms. So the universities can bypass uh, the existing legislation and the existing union systems. And then more generally, you've got things like the zero hours system where companies try to cut their costs to the bone by making sure that they don't give any long-term job security or stability to their employees and so on. And then if you look at companies trying to exploit their customers, we see over and over again, uh, if you ever manage to access this, uh, this universe, there's a European website which looks at um, cartels and price fixing. And you discover that company after company is engaged in price fixing and m price manipulation, working with other companies uh, in illegal means. And they're always being fined for it, but the fines are never enough to deter the behavior. But you mm -hmm. can see the exploitation of customers much more widely. So if you look at, say, phone tariffs, they're deliberately so complex, it's impossible to make a sensible comparison. And if you look at the tech companies, they deliberately try to ensure that their equipment will become redundant within a few years' time so that people will be forced to upgrade to new models if you want uh, to keep up with uh, the latest software or to see the latest videos and, uh, and so on. So everywhere you look, you realize there are lots and lots of subtle ways where companies are trying to exploit staff. And what you realize is, of course, the more they can exploit their customers, the more they can exploit their staff, the more they can exploit their suppliers, the more profit they can make. The whole system is geared around uh, exploiting others in order to make more profit, and ultimately then also for executives to pay themselves bigger bonuses. So uh, there's, there's issues like performance-related pay, which never get discussed in a way where you say, well, people are getting bigger bonuses the more they can rip off the rest of society. And that's, that's a, a more detailed conversation we need to have uh, someday. So uh, this idea of um, free lunches was very well known um, among almost all economists until just over a century ago.
but it's pretty much disappeared from all discussions about how the economy works and about corporate activity and about the financial system. And we need to bring it back into our conversations. And we need to say, these big companies, they are not earning their profits. The shareholders don't have the, a right to such big payouts. The executives certainly don't have a right to such enormous payouts because a lot of this corporate activity is about manipulating the system in order to make sure that more wealth ends up in, in their pockets. And so in the past, this had terms like neoliberalism or rent seeking or rentier economics. I think the simplest term is just to call it bloodsucker capitalism, where it's about uh, extracting wealth from uh, everybody else uh, as far as they can. Now, before I finish, I just want to make a couple of points about the relationship with, um, with the government. So what we're going to talk about in a future uh, class is about failings in democracy. And one of the big issues is that behind the scenes, out of sight, corporate executives and lobby companies are having private conversations with the government saying, we'd like you to change the law and the regulations so that we can make more profit. And governments are going along with this. And you've got what's called a revolving door, where senior people from business go and work in the government, and senior people in the government go and work in the business. And so they see the world from the same point of view. And so the governments have been very happy to gradually, over time, change rules and regulations to allow big companies to take uh, ever more wealth out of the, uh, the system. So we need to start recognizing that many people who in the mainstream media these days are labeled as uh, wealth creators are really just people who understand how the system is rigged and understand how to extract more from everybody else. And until we start talking about this much more uh, sort of uh, openly and much more critically, then nothing's going to change. And at the moment, everything is heading the wrong way. Corporate power is increasing and the alignment of corporate power with the, the political system is also increasing. And those together are sort of working against the 99% to, to enrich the 1%. And we'll talk more about private wealth uh, a bit more in, uh, in a future week. Okay, so there's lots more I can say, but it might be worth me just taking a, a stop there, and we'll uh, we'll see if people have got any questions or want to engage in yeah. the discussion. Well, we'll uh, we'll certainly move to that uh, towards the uh, end of the uh, of the program. There's a few uh, comments I'd just uh, like to make or queries to put to you, uh, sure. Rod. Uh, the first thing really is just for what you've described. There sounds like uh, you're describing socialism for the for the rich, aren't you? Well, that's a that's a great expression, actually, and. Uh, that is a perfect way to think about it. And it is very interesting that the vast majority of people have never really thought about how the system is socialism for the rich. But the ironic thing is, when I was doing lots of research for this, you can find interviews with um, people who run big businesses, and they understand exactly how the system works. And when they've been caught in a relaxed moment in an interview, they say it's not a capitalist system. It's not about businesses taking risks and innovating and so on. It is socialism for the rich. And I think if people understood that better, they would gradually start to be more critical uh, of the system because most of the things I've outlined probably shouldn't exist at all. So if you look at something like subsidies, you can make all sorts of arguments about why you might subsidize certain sectors of the economy and so on. But ultimately, there's really no need to a government to provide big subsidies to very big, powerful uh, companies that have very, very deep pockets. Well, we certainly saw that, didn't we? I mean, just over this COVID crisis with the, the government actually doling out contracts to their friends. But I mean, I mean that got some attention. But that's been happening for the best part of 40 plus years, hasn't it? With uh, initially the uh, so-called compulsory competitive tendering that was introduced to the National Health Service and local government, where 
public services was, was, were used as a cash cow for the private sector, were, were they not? Well, I, I think this is a huge problem. And in fact, the, the privatisation that's ongoing now of the NHS and uh, of other things, so even uh, like the school system, is steadily being privatised, although in a slightly different way. So you don't have shareholders and so on, but you still have people able to extract wealth from that system. And it is about taking the existing wealth of the nation and the existing wealth of the system and just enabling rich people who have the right contacts and the right know-how to work out how to extract some of that wealth and put it in their own pockets. And there's a very mm -hmm. interesting uh, thing if you look at the global economic system and see that in parallel to, to what goes on. So a great deal of what I talk about probably was not that obvious in the domestic in the UK um, let's say before the financial crisis so before about 2008 was if you looked internationally you could see in country after country so Russia would be the most famous one billionaires were being created almost overnight now what had happened was the wealth of the nation had just been handed on a plate to people who had the right crony connections and those things that were incredibly obvious in the international system a few years ago are becoming much more apparent in the UK today. So the thing you mentioned about the crony capitalism, I think is very interesting. And uh, in the past, I think governments would have made some attempt to disguise what's going on and try to, uh, to be a bit more clever about it. Whereas now it's just becoming so incredibly obvious that it mm. is just outright corruption and cronyism and handing contracts to your mates and the people with the right connections. So the, the people who are doing this somehow don't even feel obliged to hide it anymore. They're able to do it out there in the open. And yet despite this and the fact that occasionally the mainstream media picks up on one or two examples of this, the system never changes. If anything, mm. the system just steadily keeps moving in the wrong direction. And uh, I'm, I'm very much hoping that uh, we can gradually, over time, get more and more people to wake up to this and, uh, and start talking about this type of thing. Well, we definitely need to. But I mean, I think it's a feature, isn't it, of the collapse of the post-war consensus. And I remember... Uh, even Ted Heath, Tory Prime Minister in the uh, 1970s, uh, talking about the unacceptable face of uh, capitalism. I think he was talking about Tiny Rowlands uh, buying companies and asset stripping them. But but now they kind of see, you know, they don't seem to have any shame about doing yeah. these sorts of uh, things. But what do what do you say to uh, people like uh, Peter Mandelson, who famously once said that he was intensely rich? Uh, sorry, intensely rich. He probably is intensely rich, but intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich so long as they pay their taxes. What, what, what do you think about that? Well, so I think it's interesting that in the past, he was able to say that, and not that many people resisted that sort of statement. And one of the things that we're going to talk about in a future week is how it is that individuals manage to get so rich, because again, the system is rigged in even more ways to enable individuals to get rich. But also one of the things we're going to talk about is how having people around who have immense wealth has enormous negative consequences for the rest of society. And we'll mm. talk, it, people can kind of see it somewhat in the housing market. So the, let's say you look at the housing market in London, and we'll talk about this in much more detail in a future week. But the vast majority of new properties are sold to overseas buyers. Yeah. Many of them are yeah. sold for investment purposes. Many of them are left empty. And ordinary people in Britain have absolutely no chance of being able to afford properties uh, in many areas of the southeast. Now, there's a lot of complex reasons why housing markets work as they do. But one of the clear reasons is that the housing market is dominated by the buying power of a very rich class of people from all over the world. Mm. And we need to think that uh, a housing market is to provide 
homes for people to live in, not yeah. to provide multiple investment properties for rich people all over the world to jet set backwards and, and forwards. So you can see that very wealthy people hugely destabilize the housing market, and that has negative consequences for everyone else. But you can also see, once you start to look at it, that they start to destabilize politics. They start to influence politicians. And so it's not just companies and their lobbyists that are having quiet meetings with politicians in secret and getting rules changed. It's actually individual wealthy people having quiet chats and saying, you know, there's some interesting things going on there. Are you interested in a non-executive directorship with these firms in the future? And what can we discuss in terms of uh, various aspects of their individual businesses? So you can see that they can influence politics. And often, these things are better documented in the US than they are over here. So there's a small amount of research over here. But in the US, the research and documentation is much more thorough. And so there's a very famous pair of brothers called the Koch brothers, whose influence mm. on US politics, they're incredibly rich billionaires, uh, they're Influence has been enormous, and they fund mm -hmm. not only political parties, but they fund think tanks, they fund university um, positions to make sure that researchers are researching their point of view, and so on. So it's incredibly widespread. So you can see they can manipulate politics. And then also, if you've ever looked at what Rupert Murdoch does, you can see that individual billionaires can manipulate the media. And the media is a very, very powerful tool for propaganda. We're going to talk about that in, in a future uh, sort of session on propaganda, that uh, the, the mainstream media, where it is owned by billionaires, will tend to put forward a point of view that buys into the whole billionaire. Billionaires are reasonable. Billionaires are good. Billionaires do great things. Billionaires have earned their wealth. And they yeah. present it in a very positive way. And you alluded to this right at the beginning when you were talking about propaganda and, and how it, it sort of stretches back over the years and it permeates our societies. The whole presentation of great wealth and also related to that great power is extremely uncritical. And we need to say, well, actually, there are huge problems with that. And we need to start being much more critical uh, of the existence of billionaires. Because there's no real reason to have billionaires. We don't need them. And if they're harming our societies, then we need to question their existence. And that's a conversation that mm. no one is yet having. And I'm hoping that over time we can start having that type of conversation. So we need to actually completely change the terms of the debate on nearly every issue that we're going to talk about. So we need to change the terms of the debate on big companies. We need to change the terms of the debate on the presence of great wealth and its harm to society uh, and uh, and so on. I mean, some argue, don't they, that, you know, we need these billionaires. And just to actually put it in perspective, somebody, to, I can't remember what the statistic is now, but to actually count to a million takes you a certain amount of time. But to count <laughs> to a billion takes something like 32 years or something ridiculous. Just kind of give you the kind of perspective of, uh, you know, uh, the proportions that we are uh, talking about. But what do you say to those uh, people, uh, Rod, who say, well, yeah, but we need these billionaires because, you know, they are these sort of uh, job creators. And, uh, you know, if, if, they, if, we, if we don't have them, then, uh, you know, we're all going to be poorer. It's better to have some billionaires because we all benefit. I suppose that trickle down sort of says, well, what do you say to that? Absolutely. Well, so what I've been talking about is, uh, to, in tonight's presentation is the opposite of trickle down that actually a great deal of the time, wealth is trickling up, that their wealth is coming from everybody else's pockets. So if you think about everything that, that you buy, where uh, companies, a small number of big companies are dominant, you've probably been overcharged for all of those things. So you're probably being overcharged for mobile phones. If we had lots and lots of mobile phone companies, there's a very good chance that the prices would be much lower. So that applies to nearly everything you, uh, you buy uh, and every service that you pay for where there are small numbers of dominant companies that are able to manipulate the, the pricing structure. So the evidence is very clear 
that they are extracting wealth from our societies. And in fact, there's a specific area, which is finance, which we're going to talk about again, I hope, in a, in a later presentation. And there's some very, very good researchers at an organization called the Tax Justice Network. Yeah. And one of the people That's there is a guy called Nick Shackson, who's written a book called The Finance Curse. And in it, he explains how a really big finance um, section to the economy actually harms the rest of your economy. It is actually sucking wealth out. So I actually, my own perspective is that if we didn't have these billionaires, our society would actually be better off. Uh, but until we try going down that route, uh, it's, it's impossible to say with 100% certainty. But I don't think there's any clear evidence that the presence of billionaires is actually uh, that beneficial to our societies. If you look at where they're getting their billions from, I don't think there's any evidence that it's trickling down to the rest of us into, into society. Uh, oddly enough, there is a tiny exception to that, which I think is really important, and I, and I should mention that. So you have these billionaires and these key kind of decision makers at the highest level, but below them, you have a second tier of people who are very well paid. They're all on six-figure salaries. They're the private wealth managers. They're the management consultants. They're the accountancy firms. And uh, one day we must have a good chat about the accountancy firms because they've all been engaged in incredible frauds and corrupt activity. Uh, and so you've got this layer, this second tier of people whose main role is to make sure that they help the, the people at the top maintain their wealth and maintain their power. And those people on these six-figure salaries, wealth is trickling down to them. It's not yeah. a huge amount of wealth in terms of the economy, but there is this second tier of people on six-figure salaries who are getting that money because all they do is help the billionaires and the super rich and the big companies maintain their dominance. So yeah. if you look at the whole layer of corporate lawyers, their, their job is to keep rewriting laws and regulations over and over again, always more and more in favor of the companies to help the companies extract more wealth from society. And, and we can see this with the NHS privatization going on at the moment. That's driven by big, primarily American companies, uh, medical companies who already make huge profits in America. They want big profits over here. And they've got an army of lawyers drafting legislation for the British government. And the entire purpose of that is to privatize the health service very, very gradually. And it's been going on for years. And whilst they will always try to make arguments about greater efficiency uh, and so on, the evidence on healthcare is very clear. Privatizing a healthcare system does not make it more efficient or more cost effective or anything. It is simply about taking the existing wealth of the health system and putting it in private hands to make a small number of executives and the shareholders of those companies very, very rich. And I'm mm. very much hoping that, that the people who are already campaigning against the privatization of the NHS will keep doing so, redouble their efforts. And I hope over time, more and more people will start to understand that privatization is, is not about efficiency. It's always simply about taking existing wealth and handing it, uh, putting it in private pockets. You know, I think a lot of people are beginning to get that, Rod, but I think, um, I think people feel sort of helpless, really, about you know, what, what, what they can do. And uh, perhaps you'll just come back to that in a minute. But I just wanted to pick up on the point that you made about you know, the financial, Britain being this financial centre of the world and so on. And... Uh, both political main political parties, you know, venerate the financial sector. And indeed, in the negotiations over Brexit, I mean, that was one of the issues. Or, oh, you know, Britain might lose its status as, uh, you know, the financial capital of the world. What you're saying there, that seems to me, Rod, is uh, actually that'd be a bloody good thing. <laughs> you know, if it, if it had gone, you know, uh, and it wasn't as uh, as big an influence. I mean, they don't seem to create very many decent jobs. I remember, you know, as I say, a kid. I mean, I often make this story. Tell this story when I, as a kid growing up, uh, you know, left school at 1972, at 15 years of age, uh, 
worked in a factory, then a building trade, in and out of jobs, but managed to train as a bricklayer. And as a 19-year-old apprentice bricklayer, was earning enough money to buy my own house, you know, in a nice sort of desirable village. It, absolutely impossible in this uh, day and age. But uh, what do we do about that? I mean, you know, this is this thing about how do we shift the Overton window, I suppose. But just in terms of people, you know, watching, we've talked about, you know, changing the terms of the discussion. You know, what could people do out there? Given that, I don't know what your thoughts are in relation to where we are politically. I'm pretty depressed, I've got to say, about the state of our mainstream political parties. And indeed, in, in the United States, there is the movement for a, for a new party. And there's discussions about, you know, whether we should become, this is the resist movement, become a new party. And there's you know, a lot of people saying we need an alternative to the Labour Party, et cetera, et cetera. What's it, what, what, in, what's it, you know, in five minutes, so what, what, what's your... Uh, recipe, <laughs> Rob, for what people can do? Where can they put their efforts to sort of, uh, you know, start to try and move things in the right direction? Well, so I think that's a really good question. And I think to try and solve the problems of Britain or America or the world in five minutes is... Uh, is well, you're an, an academic. Ambitious... That's why we got you on, mate. You know, so... An ambitious, <laughs> an ambitious challenge. <laughs> so indeed. it's very interesting, actually. Um, as, as I know you're aware, Chris, one of the people that I'm very interested in is in is Julian Assange, who's been persecuted yes. by the government. And he made some very interesting points in that when he set up WikiLeaks, the aim was to make all sorts of information, usually about crimes by governments and corporations. So really important public interest information available to everyone. And he thought that that would be the key so then everybody's saying, well, this is outrageous. Look at all these terrible murders mm -hmm. that American mm -hmm. soldiers are committing in Afghanistan. Look at the Trafigura dumping the toxic waste off the coast of Africa. Mm -hmm. We have to do something. And that would motivate them to get organized. And that never materialized. And he realized that um, information by itself is not enough. So information is the starting point. And I like to think that that's where I come in that my focus is on information to help people understand the world. But once people have got that information, that then just has to be the starting point for them to take or attempt to take power. And, and this is one, power is a word that I want to keep coming back to every week. Ultimately, the, we will never achieve anything unless we find ways to take power away from the 1%. And there's a number of sort of concrete things I can talk to people about in terms of information. But in terms of the ultimate task of taking power from the 1%, I think that's really something that a mass movement needs to start debating seriously. Because uh, until you get lots of people working together, it's incredibly difficult to take power away from the 1%. But I, so I always think the first step is that everyone is talking about taking power away from the 1%. And I feel that's something that is lacking in all the movements and all the organizations that I come into contact with. They have lots of specific topics. So the NHS is the most obvious one, but there are lots of others, obviously, and they're campaigning about all of these things. But if you look at any one topic, so the NHS is a great example. The decisions about what's happening to the NHS now were probably taken years ago in complex negotiations with corporate yeah. lawyers, right? Ordinary people were not present at those discussions, okay? There is this huge power imbalance that the government listens to the 1%, but is not listening at all to the 99%. So the first thing people have to be saying is, all of our discussions about whatever specific topic we're interested in probably will tie into taking power back from the 1%. And we need to think very creatively about how we do that. And so you can see specific things where if you look at, say, corporate lobbying, every now and again, an example of corporate lobbying gets into the mainstream media. And so some protesters will say, what we need is a register of lobbyists, and we'll have more information and once people have information, that's great, and then we can make a change. But in fact, that was the discussion people had a few years ago about executive pay. Everybody said, well, if we had greater transparency, then we'd deal with it. 
Well, actually, we have a lot more transparency on executive pay. It may not be perfect, but we know there's all of these people being paid bucket loads of money. And uh, just on a specific point, we know that many of the executives in the financial companies who nearly destroyed the economy in 2008 were paid enormous bonuses even in the years when they were destroying their own banks and the economy. So yeah. people understand these things, but it hasn't made any difference to people's attempts uh, to deal with it. And so we have to recognize that simply having transparency is a sort of necessary first step, but it's not going to be the solution. The solution is going to be people working together to be altogether more aggressive about demanding change to the system. And one of the things I tried to do years and years ago was to write to lots of NGOs and say to them, if we don't change the system, you're going to be campaigning on whatever specific topic your NGO focuses on. So it can be Greenpeace, it could be Human Rights Watch. You're going to be campaigning on that for hundreds of years, really making very little difference if we don't change the system. Whereas if all the NGOs got together and started to speak with one voice and said, we all need to take power away from the 1%, then maybe we've got a, cha a chance of making serious changes that would actually enable many of the things that Greenpeace focuses on to improve and many of the things that Human Rights Watch focuses on to improve and many of the things that the, uh, the NHS privatization campaigners want to change to improve and so on. So I think there's a problem at the moment with a lack of coordination and a lack of direction because everyone, to some extent, everyone is still sort of working out what to do after the last election and uh, Jeremy Corbyn not being elected. And people feel a bit directionless. In the past, they, they had a Labour Party where they could go to and it, it might have made a difference. You might have actually mm -hmm. had some grassroots input into the Labour Party, whereas now you actually don't have any real significant grassroots input into Labour Party policy. And we need to start thinking about how we coordinate and how we work together much more so than, than we do. So we try to move away from these little pockets of people where each of them are discussing one or two topics, but nobody's kind of working together on, on the big picture uh, stuff. Yeah. So, I so mean, what you're yeah. saying there, Rod, is uh, it's just kind of reinforcing my opinion, really, that our so-called representative democracy is a sham. And you also make a really important point, I think, and it's something that was brought out in a documentary that was sponsored by Michael Moore. You mentioned Michael Moore just earlier on there, where the billionaire class are sort of colonizing the green movement now as well. So that's something I think we need to be mindful of. But before I bring Sean in, just to get reaction from our audience, I just wanted to, there's lots of other questions I wanted to put to you, but one of the uh, points that you made, and I think it's just worth teasing out a little bit more from you about it, is you talked about, you didn't put it in these terms, but you talked about built-in obsolescence. Um, I mean, some people would argue that that helps to sustain and generate jobs. So how do you respond to that? So you can i remember bill uh bill uh not bill not bill barack obama uh, apparently he was asked about having an nhs and he said well what are we going to do with all those people who are currently working in the private system you know it, it provides thousands and thousands of jobs but at the end of the day i think we have to question uh certain aspects about job creation uh, in terms of doing things in ways uh, that are bizarrely uh, negative for society. So if you, if you look at uh, the obsolescence, uh, every mobile phone that, that's made is using resources coming out of the ground, and it's probably going somewhere like India where somebody is taking apart poisonous materials, and th then it, some of it's getting dumped, some of it's uh, poisoning people, some of it's uh, possibly getting reused depending on what it is. But uh, the idea that we just need to focus on job creation in these bizarre ways, when in fact, 
what I would like to see is people saying, starting really to, to ask fundamental questions about, instead of saying create more jobs, if you had the same number of jobs with people working four days a week instead of five days a week, which in many industries you could do, and where if you were careful about how um, people are paid and so on, you could ensure that people's living standards did not decrease. I think there is a much bigger conversation to be had. But I also think if the focus is to be on jobs, there are far better ways to employ people uh, than in making ever more mobile phones because they're yeah. obsolete. So, for example, if you just take the NHS, the government is deliberately massively underfunding it at the moment with the intention of making the service worse and worse to help to justify its partial yes, gradual privatization, right? So we need a properly funded and a properly staffed NHS. And this was one of the complaints during the coronavirus that actually many uh, nurses worked astonishing hours yeah and over time, and they were exhausted permanently. Whereas if you look at a healthcare system like Germany, uh, it's, it, there's all sorts of uh, differences, but one of the key differences is they have far more many beds and staff per mm -hmm. thousand members of the population. And it's yeah. a properly funded system. And it didn't come close to breaking point, whereas ours no. comes close to breaking point no, every single year, which is, I, yeah. in my yeah. opinion, that's a, a deliberate policy of the government, actually, mm -hmm. so that it is at breaking point every year. Let's, and, let's, uh, I'm going to say, let, let's move to uh, Sean, but uh, just on your point about a four-day week, never mind about a four-day uh, week, uh, Rod, uh, John Maynard Keynes said nearly 100 years ago that by now we should be working uh, a 15-hour uh, average working week. And I grew up in the 60s where we were being told to get ready for the leisure generation uh, by the 1990s and 2000s. It never, it never happened. People are working longer than they've ever done and uh, earning less uh, as a proportion uh, than, than they many people anyway than they previously did. But we perhaps spoke for a bit too long, actually. <laughs> Rod, it's really, really interesting and fascinating. But I just want to give an opportunity now for our audience to put some points to you and I'll bring in Sean. Good evening. It's good oh. to be back. Oh, um, hi, Sean. Nice to have hi. you back, comrade. Um, good to be speaking to everybody on the chat again this evening. Um, just in case you're listening to us through the podcast, uh, this is uh, fi filmed live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on YouTube. You can join us for live chat. We can put your questions and comments to our guests. Um, also, please hit the subscribe button, like, and hit the bell icon. Okay, so now we've got those housekeeping things out of the way. Um, we've had lots of comments and, uh, and questions coming through for you tonight, Rod. Um, Diana said, um, the propaganda also hides who holds the power, who controls elective representatives. She went on to say that big corporations buy up smaller, genuinely innovative co uh, companies to close down the competition. Um, just going on to uh, uh, on the same vein of that, onto a, a different question: um, Can ordinary businesses compete with companies trading on the stock market? And how can we make this a more equal system? And uh, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about the GameStop um, issue that arose a few weeks ago, where people had suddenly. Uh, thought about the stock market people were being encouraged to buy stock in game in the game stock market but huge corporations were kicking off because obviously the game was up they'd been found out and um they didn't like it at all um have you got some comments on that uh so i think the interesting about the, the small business question is very very interesting because uh, i should point out my brother runs a small farm shop so I actually have a sort of personal insight into small businesses. And uh, ever since uh, he started running it, he would point out the various um, advantages that uh, big competitors, so the big supermarket chains in this case, uh, would have. And I think it's incredibly difficult for small businesses in most industries to compete against the big players. And 
if people are starting to talk about power and uh, small versus big businesses is a great example of where you have a power asymmetry. So the big businesses have all the advantages and they have the political connections uh, and so on. Then ultimately, if we're to start thinking about taking power away from organizations that have too much power, we need to start to ask questions about the existence of big profit-driven companies at all. So I can't provide um, a kind of tactical suggestion to a small company in terms of how to run its business. But I think that small business owners are actually a key group of people who should be working with everybody else to say to the government, these big businesses have too much power and they are using it in manipulative uh, ways. And it's always seemed to me that you can never, whilst you have a great economic power, so that's very rich people and very big, powerful companies pursuing profit as their primary goal, then you are never going to get away from this problem. So you either have to say about all big companies, they are so important to our societies, and we saw this with the, the financial crisis, but it actually applies to the supermarkets and many other big businesses like the oil companies and so on, that we have to say to them, we're going to change the way you operate so your primary goal is not shareholder returns. And I'm hoping in a, in a few weeks' time we'll do a session on corporate crime I think will be quite eye-opening to a lot of people. But one of the problems is that at the moment, companies and uh, people sort of learn this in business school, focus on shareholder returns, irrespective of the harms that these companies and businesses do to the mm. rest of society. And we're going to have to start saying these businesses are so important to our societies and so powerful that we're not going to allow them to focus on shareholder profits anymore. They are going to have to focus on benefits to society. So you could nationalize all of them, and that would be one possible solution with all of the biggest industries that, that are important to a, a country. Or you could say we are going to completely change corporate law so they're not operating for shareholders. They're operating in the benefit to the benefit of society, which is probably a more complex route, but maybe more easy to work through, if that makes sense, that I think... Yeah. Well, what about, yeah. uh, just to, can I just come in there quickly, uh, uh, Rod? What about creating a worker cooperatives as an alternative? So I haven't studied worker cooperatives in any great detail. I'm aware that they are successful in a number of uh, different countries, and I know that Waitrose sort of operates on that sort of uh, business model. Uh, you would have to look very closely at let's say if you took Waitrose and analyzed it in detail, is it still primarily focused on its profits and shareholder returns, or is it working much more in the interests of society? From what I've seen, whilst there might be differences kind of at the edges, at the margins, I'm not convinced it's entirely different. So it might have to be something more than that. But you could have a system where you set up worker cooperatives that are structured to work for the benefit of employees and society more generally. Because there was, uh, there was something in the manifesto, uh, Rod, uh, the Labour manifesto of 2017, that uh, talked about uh, companies being sold, possibly asset stripped, where before they could do that, the, the workers would be given the first right of refusal to buy the com company out. I, I wanted the party to go further than that, but I thought that was quite a innovative and, and, and important uh, and beneficial first step. Well, I think opinion. that would be... A... Sorry, go on. No, 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 no. I'm just going to go back to Sean, but if you've got something else to say, go on. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think that's that's something worth looking at seriously and then deciding if a, a business was sold uh, or taken over by its employees, what then were their responsibilities and so on? And what were they focusing on? And I think that it would be a great first step. And then you could easily change the regulations around them. But essentially, what, what you need more than anything is a sort of um, overarching rule that says 
first do no harm. Indeed. And in, in fact, there's a, there's a um, oddly enough, Hollywood is one of the great propaganda systems, but there's a, people will have heard of the Spider-Man movies, and there's a great phrase in that movie, uh, which is incredibly important, which is, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think powerful people have forgotten this. And in fact, uh, researching all the things that I research, I would say that the two most important words or the most important phrase in all of human history is probably power corrupts. Mm. And you can, you can see it everywhere, whether it's big business, whether it's military adventures overseas and so on. And if everyone is thinking that whenever they're working out policies, I think mm. there's a chance that we can restrain power. So power always needs to operate within an ethical framework. And yeah. strangely enough, I mentioned Adam Smith as one of the most well-known free market academics. But there's another famous free market academic called Milton Freeman, oh. Friedman. Sorry. And even yeah. he recognized yes. yeah. that big business has to operate within an ethical framework. Otherwise, yeah, was, bad things it was a big It was a big influence on Thatcher, as was uh, Friedrich uh, Hayek. But uh, I liked your phrase about uh, do no harm or do least harm. That's a good vegan principle, which is uh, yes. what I try to live by. But anyway, go back to Sean, because we're running out of time. I've only got about three minutes left. Go on, Sean. Any yeah, I think, we, I think, yeah, we've got a lot, but I, I think we've only got time for about one more question. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm going to go with Jonathan's. Uh, why do you think the mainstream left lack the will to do the hard graft of mass movement building and raising class consciousness. Mm. Well, oddly enough, I think Chris is much better placed to answer that question than me. So strangely <laughs> enough, the, when I, I study the economy and I study war crimes and all this sort of thing, when it comes to mass movement building, uh, that's, that's something that I think you would, you'd need to, you either live it for decades to understand it, or or you spend hundreds of, or thousands of hours as an academic researching that specific topic, which is not something I've done. So I don't know if you have an answer to that question. I think I think one of the reasons. I mean, obviously we could spend a whole program on that, but I think one of the main reasons is that we've become obsessed with, I mean, we've been used to a, a sort of a, a party political structure and electoral strategy. Uh, and that being the be all and end all, and indeed, you know, the whole thing about the Labour Party has been, you know, its first and foremost priority is to not be very successful at it, actually, but it's to elect a Labour government. And it's that sense of handing over responsibility to our elected representatives, and they'll then do worthy things and do goodly works, as it were. Well, we know they don't. Yeah. I mean, and the, you know, with some notable exceptions, uh, they just don't. They are just as uh, susceptible to being influenced by these pernicious uh, lobbyists. And it's ironic that David Cameron said, I think it was in 2010, 2010 that the, the next big big scandal is going to be uh, lobbying. Uh, absolutely right. And um, so I think that's been part of the problem. Jeremy did start to make an effort to move away from that model, talks about creating a social movement, building a, a grassroots social mass movement, uh, and that being very important. But there's such a lot of opposition to that, uh, vested interests, both outside and inside Parliament, most of the parliamentary Labour Party are very, very cosy and comfortable with the present system. It works for them. You know, they have a cosy, you know, nice sort of handsome salary and a nice pension. But also, as you point out, Rod, uh, potential lucrative non-executive directorships afterwards, uh, consultancies and things like this. And uh, that's the thing that we need to move away from. And I think it's really going to have to come from the grassroots really a need and through the kind of thing, sort of things that we're trying to do and what you've been doing uh, this evening kind of this whole notion of knowledge is power uh, but that sense that we've got to in some way try to between us instill a sense of our power is in collective action is in solidarity and just wean ourselves off this notion that the, we'll solve all the world's problems if only we can get a labor government elected it ain't gonna it's not gonna work we need a mass movement. We need that strength in depth. And the best, in my opinion, example of that, or one of the best anyway, that I'm familiar with, is in Latin America. And I often speak about, you know, Bolivia being the most recent example of that. Fantastic. You know, the movement towards socialism is a mass movement. 
you know, trade unionists and civil society. And when the Yanks uh, supported a coup against uh, uh, Evo Morales after he'd been elected in a landslide and they kicked him out, that movement was so strong that within 12 months, They'd, they'd forced new elections and the socialists came back with an even bigger majority. And all the privatizations that they were going for, the IMF loan, the fact the, the new president said, you can stick your IMF loan, send it back, send the money back. We don't need it, mate. You know, That's the model, I think, that we need to move towards. We've just got to wean ourselves off that sense of, uh, oh, you know, we just need, you know, just get some decent people elected and everything will be grossy in the garden. It won't be. We've got over time now, Sean. <laughs> Yeah, we, as, uh, as usual. Um, yeah. yeah, we've got lots more we could have spoken about, yeah, but I'm sure these these things will come up um, well, again in Rod, future Rod, 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 episodes. Absolutely. Well, and Rod is sorry to go across you there, but Rod, Rod has agreed to, to come back and do, do a series of sessions uh, with us, and we'll just have to work out the frequency of them. Where you know, and uh, but certainly, I think you know on, on a regular basis. So, uh, Rod will be a, a regular uh, feature on uh, on Resistor TV in, in, in the coming uh, months, uh, picking up on some of these key issues and maybe some of the questions tonight. Sean, that we weren't able to to pick up. Rod might be able to uh, pick up in later programs, and perhaps I'll have to. Well, the, the conversation between Rod and I will have to be perhaps truncated more to give more time for for questions from the audience. But Sean, you were you were just saying some something else just before I cut across you there. Just, oh no, I was saying. I was just talking about the um, some of the questions. One of the, one of the big thing, obviously, but one of the big things, particularly about capitalism, is it comes down to um, it comes down to the media. It seems to always come down to the media and how the left can't get our message out there. We don't have the chance to change that narrative um so i think propaganda the way it's used um, by the government um to sort of brainwash people really mm, uh, through yeah. the tv through the newspapers through the radio and i think that's that that would be a really good thing to address maybe in a yeah. future issue well that that's certainly one of the things that we will be uh, touching on with, with rod and i hope everybody will agree that rod's been a brilliant guest thank you very much indeed rod driver our resident academic for for a while now <laughs> thank you so very much uh, for look, having me we, we, we look forward to uh, seeing you again uh, soon, Rod, to pick up on some of those other topics that you that you mentioned there. I uh, hope everybody's enjoyed this evening. I thought it was a really fascinating uh, discussion and apologies as usual. We haven't had time to, to take in more questions and I, I will promise when we get Rod back on, and that might be next week, but we just have to talk about that with Rod to check his availability. Uh, I promise that we will give more time for audience uh, reaction and questions. So thank you very much indeed again for watching this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, we'll be back on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, same time, same place. So please tune in next week and we'll see you then. Thanks again and good night.